COVID-19 is changing the world as we know it. When infections soared earlier this year, governments worldwide implemented strict social distancing measures that have slowed the global economy dramatically. So far, there have been more than half a million deaths, with 10 million people infected worldwide. But the huge financial cost of the pandemic has forced many countries to ease restrictions and reopen their economies. The United Kingdom, one of the world's largest economies, has among the highest COVID-19 infection and death rates. British scientists, like many others, are working around the clock to find a vaccine. With one of the country's most renowned institutions, the University of Oxford, fighting the pandemic on multiple fronts. Professor Martin Landre is one of the scientists leading the recovery trial. It's the world's largest randomized clinical trial of potential COVID-19 treatments. He's not looking for a cure as such. He's focused instead on finding readily available drugs that can be used immediately to reduce the number of deaths. Will there ever be a cure for COVID-19 or even a vaccine? Or will we all just have to learn to live with the virus? Find out more as Professor Martin Landre talks to Al Jazeera. Professor Martin Landre, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Well, thank you very much for having me. You're currently running the world's biggest trial of possible coronavirus treatments. Why is that such an important area of research when so much of the focus elsewhere is on a vaccine as being the way out of this crisis? Well, it's quite clear to me we need both vaccines and treatments. We need vaccines to prevent the disease, but we're some way off getting a vaccine. Not only discovering one that works, but discovering one that we can use in millions or possibly billions of people. We need treatment because people are sick today. People are dying from COVID today and tomorrow and next month. And even if we have a vaccine, there will still be some people who don't get it for whatever reason, and they also will need treatment. So we need both. It's a twin strategy. It's not a competition. We need, we need both. Of course, in the end, as you've pointed out yourself, there is no guarantee that we'll ever get a vaccine. Well, that's certainly true. Um, there's a lot of hope. There's some really good work going on at incredible speed at the moment. But it's entirely possible that actually none of those will turn out to be scalable, effective vaccines. Um, as we've seen with HIV. I mean, HIV, people have been looking for a vaccine for whatever it is now, 30 or 40 years, and we still don't have one. But the success we have in HIV is a series of drugs, each of which re reduce the risks by a relatively small amount, and you put them together, and now patients take three or four drugs together, big effects. I think it's much more likely that we'll find a series of treatments that will reduce the risk of the important things, some, you know, the risks of dying, uh, if you're admitted to hospital, the risk of going on to ventilator, improve your chances of getting out of hospital quickly. But, it, but affect each of those by, say, a fifth. So if you took you know, currently 20 or 25 percent of people who get admitted to a hospital um, uh, uh, die, while, uh, die in that hospital, if we could reduce that by a fifth, that would be massive. Well, let's get into the nitty gritty of your trial. It's called Recovery, which is a clever acronym standing for Randomised Evaluation of COVID-19 Therapy. Tell us about the trial. Well, the trial is, uh, is seriously large. We were quite clear that we needed a trial that could pick up these modest effects. It's running across the UK, 175 hospitals, NHS hospitals, up and down the whole of the UK. Uh, COVID is a disease can affect anyone, any age, and so this is a trial that's open to anyone. And we're studying currently uh, five or six treatments, uh, which are, we think have some promise or where people have raised expectations that they might be effective treatments, and frankly, we really need to know. And you're looking at them in combination rather than looking for that sort of single silver bullet. Well, we're certainly not looking works. for a single bu a silver bullet. Some of them were are being used in, in isolation, so patients just get one treatment. Some of them are being used in, in combination, so people can get two or three treatments. You know, statistically, it's quite a complicated design. Conceptually, it's actually quite easy. The question is, if you're a doctor is by the bedside of a patient who's uh, got COVID, how should they treat them? And that's what the, what the trial's addressing. And, and to better understand the possible outcomes here, you talk about reducing deaths perhaps by a fifth. I mean, that's, that's pretty modest, isn't it? Well, on its own, it's pretty modest. Um, but if one say said, well, you know, last week or the week before, there were 20,000 deaths in the United States, just to pick an example from COVID, and if you reduce that by a fifth, that would be 4,000 lives saved in a week. 
That's the United States, you look in Brazil, or you look in India, or you look in other parts of the world, then these could be really massive effects. And if you put one fifth with another fifth and another fifth, if you find two or three treatments like this, then we're starting to talk about seriously large effects, even on a one by one basis. How are you uh, doing with those early results? And, and, and at what point do you start, if these things are effective, being able to roll them out? Well, there's two questions in one there. Um, we've chosen drugs uh, in this sort of first phase, which we could, if they turn out to be effective, can be rolled out very, very rapidly. So these are drugs that because are... Because they're ready. essentially off the shelf. They're off the shelf drugs. I mean, take um, you know, dexamethasone, a steroid. I mean, that's in every hospital in the world. Um, so if that works, that could be extremely effective and rolled out instantly. If it doesn't work, we need to know that so we don't use it. But we won't get all results at the same time because not all drugs were started in the trial at the same time, not all patients are suitable for all drugs. Um, and of course, the, uh, this phase of the epidemic in the UK is subsiding somewhat, good thing, but that means that some of the results will be a little bit later coming and that's fine. And the point here is prevention or reducing symptoms or both? Well, this is particularly focused on the group of patients who are sick enough to get into hospital. And then when, for patients who are in hospital, the questions are pretty um, uh, straightforward. Will they need a ventilator and will they die? And those are really the things that we're trying to affect with these treatments. In other words, reduce the need for a ventilator. Reduce the need for a ventilator, improve survival, reduce the time that people are in hospital. All of those would be important both for the patient and for the health system that has to cope with these enormous numbers of patients. What we need is evidence. We have to have evidence and get that evidence as quickly as we can and make sure that evidence is robust as possible, which is what large randomized trials do, and then make our policies on the basis of some evidence. We cannot just be using these treatments arbitrarily, willy-nilly, just because it seems like a good idea. Sometimes the rush to do something is not the right response. What one needs to do is, is to uh, understand what the disease is doing, understand the treatments, find effective treatments and use those. And if a treatment is not effective or worse still is harmful, abandon those. One thing I'd say in the UK which has been extremely helpful is that by and large we haven't gone down that route of making hoped for drugs like hydroxychloroquine and others just sort of available for doctors to prescribe because they want to do something. What we've done instead is to create a, this very large randomized trial covering every hospital in the country and say if you've got an uncertainty about how to treat these patients you can randomize them into this trial and we can get the answers actually quicker than anybody, really robust answers. It's either a tick or it's a cross and we move on. Does it make your job harder, having politicians making these sorts of pronouncements that muddy the waters while you as the scientific community are dealing with actual facts, looking for actual solutions? I focus on my job. Um, my job is to create the evidence. I don't, I don't feel that my job is either to promote or, 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 um, or otherwise one particular treatment or another. I actually don't feel particularly responsible for would a, will a particular drug work. What I feel really responsible for is understanding and discovering whether the drug works. So people can come up with ideas, it, they need testing, and the randomised trial tests those ideas. It does, to some extent, all serve to highlight, though, how p political COVID-19 has become globally. Uh, on top of being a global health emergency, you've got countries and governments uh, vying against one another, not just in the search for vaccines and uh, therapeutics and so on as you are doing, but also vying against one another for who has the highest death toll, who was least prepared and so on. Um, governments may say they're acting in the public interest, but increasingly the worry must be that they're beginning to act in their own interests, covering their tracks, trying to make it look like they were doing something when actually they weren't. Well, I mean, yeah, this is global politics and that's, I'm unqualified to comment on global politics, but what I would say is But it's that something that your community, your scientific community in this country is directly exposed to almost every day in the conflict between yeah, scientific advisors they, and the government and the advice that the government chooses to take or not. What I'd say that COVID has done is that health and science 
and education have traditionally seen, been seen as luxuries or even um, costs to the burdens on the economy. What COVID has demonstrated is that unless you get the science and the uh, healthcare and the education right, you do not have an economy. And I think that that's one of the most fundamental shifts that we've seen over the last three or four months, you, that suddenly health and health science is absolutely necessary if one is to have a functioning economy. And I think that that's not a local issue or a national or regional issue, that is an international issue. And I think it's something we all have to grasp. Does it worry you that in this country, that equation now seems to be shifting yet further ahead to the primacy of the economy again over health and lives, the importance of re restoring the economy over the importance of getting these sorts of solutions in place? Well, clearly, economy and health are very closely intertwined. But as I've just said, I think that what's become so obvious is that one can have wishful thinking about economy, but if one doesn't deliver the health, then the economy will just fall over. And so health and the science, I think, has been one of the real strengths, actually, of this country, um, you know, particularly if one looks at the vaccine research and the clinical trial research. You know, the recovery trial is the largest randomised trial in the world. The WHO have a trial. It's about a third of the size and involves many different countries. But in the last 10 weeks or so, we have included over 11,000 people in every hospital up and down the country. That is something that the UK should be incredibly proud of. And the information that we generate from that, the results we get from that, and not only inform how we treat NHS patients here in the UK, but how patients should be treated internationally. And so I think that that's phenomenally valuable and is something we should be proud of. But as I've said before, if you don't get the health right and you don't get the science right, you have no economy, whatever you might wish. Well, on that point, there's the moral imperative as well, uh, that whatever solutions are found, be it vaccine, be it therapeutics, be it a combination of the two, that all countries on earth get them and all people on earth have equal access to them, not just the rich countries at the expense uh, of the poor. Uh, and even within societies, ensuring that all groups within society have equal uh, access. What will you be doing? Is there anything you can do with your research to ensure that that moral imperative is met? Well, within the UK, the trial is open to anybody who's admitted to hospital. So let's start at that point. Uh, so the proportion from uh, black and uh, e ethnic minority communities that's in the recovery trial very nicely mirrors the proportion of all patients who go into uh, hospital with COVID. How do we manage that? Well, we've, made, we've translated things into the relevant languages. We're in every hospital, in local communities. We've been very transparent about everything that we're doing. Um, and we have a local research nurses and clinical staff who really understand their communities. So that's one thing we can do. The second thing we can do is to generate evidence that's relevant to everybody. And that is exactly what we're doing. It's relevant to a diverse range of people in the UK, but a diverse range of people internationally. And the third thing is to be really clear when we have results is to get those out and we know that they're robust. So we have to make sure we get firm conclusions to get that, those out as quickly, as widely and comprehensively as possible so that people can act on those results at speed wherever they might be. I mean, this is the sort of thing we hear a lot of at the moment in the race for a vaccine. Uh, the developing world clearly concerned that they'll be left at the back of the queue. It is an absolutely unthinkably immense job, isn't it? Getting this stuff to the whole world. Yes. Four and a half billion doses of the vaccine may be needed, your drugs uh, as well. How do you scale up to that extent? How do you get it to the refugee camps in Bangladesh? How do you even get it to all communities in a country like the United States? The inequality is laid bare at the moment, no national health service. Well, I, you know, COVID is laying bare the, those inequalities. There's no doubt about that. And those inequalities don't get solved by taking a uniform blanket approach. And very often what they require is a tailored local approach to the local community. Now, local community can be 
a particular refugee camp or it can be an entire country or it can be a region of the United States but you have uh, but you have to think about delivery at those at those local levels but when it comes to supply chain that's not entirely a local problem that's about manufacturing distribution price that's where the world the work of World Bank, Wellcome, Gates, uh, uh, the EU and so on becomes so important and the fundraising that they're doing, not thinking about how do we get a neat little publication in some journal, but actually how do we get a treatment that actually d is delivered to patients across the world where they need it. That full journey is a much more complicated journey and a much more expensive journey, but we have to start on that journey now, even if we don't know which vaccine works, even if we don't know which treatment works. And so I would say, if, for example, uh, manufacturing of a particular vaccine or of particular drugs uh, is done and then the results come through and it turns out that they are not as effective as we'd all hoped, we should not be quick to criticise that. That's preparedness. And the nature of preparedness is that every now and again you don't need it. The point about preparedness is when you do need it, it's there and it's there now. And so it's not a surprise that we have to invest in a number of both drugs and vaccines or candidates and the supply chains and the whole apparatus of delivering these to those local communities, wherever they might be. We have to invest in that now in order to be prepared for when the scientists and the, and the research uh, it um, comes up with something that we have clear evidence for. And there does seem to be something like a, an unprecedented level of cooperation at the moment among the global drug companies already pointing in the right direction. Yes, I would say that it's, it's been noticeable who, how well particularly the big pharmaceutical companies have, have addressed this. I mean, I sit on the outside of this, um, uh, but I think it's you know, interesting that you know, AstraZeneca are already manufacturing drug for the Oxford vaccine, which, which we don't yet know whether that's an going to be an effective vaccine. Other companies have, um, Roche donated tocilizumab as a drug to the recovery trial. You know, there's a number of examples where industry, big pharma, is helping in seriously um, proactive and almost philanthropic ways in order to, to, to deliver an improved uh, health uh, globally. There are, of course, exceptions to that, um, where people think more narrowly about their particular drug and their particular market share and, their, and so on and so forth. But I would say that there are a number of the big key players, whether you look in government, in charity, in health sector or pharma, that have acted extraordinarily well and helpfully. And that, that's been really rewarding, I'd say. Um, another big problem, uh, one assumes, to the, the idea of global uptake of whatever uh, drugs become effective or, or, and are made available is the idea of uh, the anti-vaxxers, the people who, uh, for whatever reason, don't want to take it for themselves or believe that a vaccine or a particular drug might be harmful to their children. There's also a plethora of conspiracy theories around that these things might be infused with microchips tracking their movements and so on. I mean, I mean is there a danger? And, and, and as these conspiracy theories grow online, that whatever solutions are made available aren't taken up in sufficient numbers to provide the sort of immunity across the global population that's required. Well, we, we, all, you know, we always have those challenges and I think um, I think the first thing we can do is be really certain about ourselves and our own evidence. Uh, it's, it's hard to win pe other people over when in fact the evidence that you have to back up your case um, is not as convincing as even you would like. So you, the first thing is to actually get the, get the good evidence. I think at the same time is the education and the impact. And we're back to communities again, really, um, about working with communities. And communities are you know, particular sectors of society, they're particular patches of the world, um, they're particularly politi political dimensions. Mm. But we have to get and work with, with communities. And the success has always been when you actually work with communities. Different communities have different leaders. The leader is not always the highest paid person who sits at the top of the tree, but they have different uh, leaders in terms of influencers. And I think one needs to think about that very carefully. Well, it takes us back as well, doesn't it, to the idea of political messaging and getting that absolutely right and building the public trust and confidence. Yes, I mean, it's, you know, one thing to think about is that, you know, to take vaccines or drugs, it doesn't really matter whose vaccine or whose drug or whose clinical trial demonstrates that you know, 
the drug works or the vaccine works and the trial demonstrates success, the research is successful. That's not what's important uh, because it's actually a global challenge. And the fact that there are you know, dozens of people trying to develop vaccines, uh, many people trying to think about trials, uh, actually, you know, we, we just need some winners and we don't really mind where they come from. Having said that, I think that just going back to randomised trials of drugs, we have seen this in previous outbreaks. We've seen this even in this outbreak when it was in China, and we, it, began, it begins to migrate around the world, a phenomenon that everybody uh, wants to do their trial. And if we're not careful, we end up with dozens or actually literally hundreds of small trials which never recruit very many people. They're not particularly well done and they really don't have a, any hope of providing an answer. And so one of these bits of coming together is actually prioritising which are the most likely treatments, the most interesting treatments, the, most, the treatments that you could quickly get out to many, many people, prioritising those into a few seriously large trials. And if you do that, you can get answers remarkably quickly. You'll get an answer every couple of months. Dozens and dozens, hundreds and hundreds of small studies because this drug, I quite like this drug, or I've got a test for that drug, or whatever else it might be, uh, is not the way forward. We have to have some uh, prioritisation. Few big studies deliver answers and move on. Are you worried, Professor Landre, about the prospect of a second wave here in the UK, possibly much sooner than anybody uh, had feared because of the speed with which the lockdown is being lifted, which many in your community, many scientists like you are saying is simply too fast. The defence mechanisms are not there to guard against uh, a rise in the infection rate. I mean, I fully understand the balance between economy, um, people's need to do something, actually the mental health of being alone at home uh, and the health issues that go with coronavirus. Having said that, it seems quite clear to me that at the moment we have no, still have no treatments, so we're no further forward than we were in January, uh, and we still have no vaccine, so we're no further forward today from where we were in January. That's all moving very, very fast, but it's not going to be. In a, we're not going to have those sorts of answers, you know, today and tomorrow. And so it's quite clear that the more people you bump into, the more people, uh, the, the greater the risk of infecting each other. We don't even other. have an effective test, trace and isolate system and may not have for some time to come. Yeah, so, you know, the test, treat and vaccinate are the, are the fundamentals. And I would add to that actually support, some more support emotionally, mentally and, and economically, um, because we have to make this, uh, you know, people have to live but we have to ensure that we balance that against, uh, against the challenges that the coronavirus really is throwing at us. Finally, there's lots of talk about inquiries that may or may not happen in the aftermath, not just here, but all over the world to find out what went wrong. There are real lessons to be learnt though, aren't there? This is a global pandemic, not the first, and it won't be the last. Oh, there's certainly le lessons to learn. There's, you know, a, fool goes, a fool goes through life and, uh, and doesn't learn any lessons. I think there are some really positive lessons to learn. There have been some, some areas of extraordinary success, some areas of collaboration and real delivery at a speed and scale we just haven't seen. You know, I normally work in cardiovascular disease. It would normally take me a year and a half, two years to just recruit the number of patients into the study that we've just done in the last three months, let alone get results, probably another couple of years beyond that to get results. And the costs would probably be t 10 times greater. And so actually with uh, the right approach to uh, the governance, to the uh, delivery, to the prioritisation, you know, it's made a massive difference. So there's some really positive lessons to learn which we should not lose. And of course there are some things which we should have done better. You know, we should learn from those too. But right now the challenge is we still have coronavirus, we still have no treatment, we still have no vaccine and we, the testing is only just being rolled out. I think all of that was changing very fast, but that should be our, our real focus. So, I'm sorry, just to pick up on that, we, should, we really oughtn't to be going out quite so readily and living our lives. I'm very nervous about uh, going back to normal. I'm nervous about going back to normal in the way we lead our lives. I'm actually uh, nervous that we go back to business like it was before, all our business like it was before. I think actually one of the things about this is it's a time to reset 
uh, our values, our ways of life, but also so many of the things which we did as a matter of routine and orthodoxy and tradition, which the viruses and, this, and dealing with the virus has shown we can actually make changes which are substantially for the better, and we need to learn from those two. Professor Martin Landry, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much indeed.